if you know this, but some people call you a fascist. Yeah, they do. Oh, so my I figure God. it's all right to call them a communist. Yeah, they call me a lot worse than I call them. A lot of people listening to this, myself included, that doesn't think that Kamala is a communist. I believe you have to fight fire with fire. Politics is a dirty game. It is a dirty game. It's certainly true. How do you win at that game? They suffer from massive Trump derangement syndrome, mm. TDS. And I don't know if they're, it's curable from their standpoint. I think uh, we'd probably have a better world if everybody in Congress took some mushrooms, perhaps. First of all, medical marijuana oh has been God. amazing. It's been, I, I've had friends and I've had others and doctors telling me that it's been absolutely amazing. The list of clients that went to the island has not been made public. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. The following is a conversation with Donald Trump on this, the Lex Friedman podcast. Uh -huh. They're getting smaller and smaller. They're getting smaller. Right? I mean, peop people do respect you more when you have a big camera for some no, reason. No, it's cool. And about 20 guys that you pay a fortune to, right? All right. Okay. You said that you love winning. And you have won a lot in life. Yeah, but you lost in uh, real estate, How's it feel? in business, in TV, in politics. So let me start with a mindset, a psychology question. What drives you more, oh, the love of winning or the hate of losing? Mm -hmm. Maybe equally, maybe uh, both. Uh, I don't like losing. And but Trump is not a complex person. I don't know why the fuck you would ask a question like that. Trump is, Trump is really stupid. Like. It takes you a while to get there because you think you always maybe he's onto something. It became successful, or he like you know found his way to the presidency. No, Trump's really dumb. Like okay, he's very shallow. He's a shell of a man. He probably hates himself. There's not really any other explanation for the behavior. Like, okay, I do like winning. Uh, I've never thought of it as to which is more of a driving Loader force. Box, do you like being based or do you just not like being cringe? I don't know. <laughs> It's a really good question. That's a really good question, as I'm currently uh, applying for the job of Chief of Staff of the IDF. Okay. You've been close with a lot of the greats in sport. Uh, you think about Tiger Woods, Muhammad Ali. You have people like uh, Michael Jordan, who I think hate losing more than anybody. So what do you learn from those guys? Well, they do have something different. You know, the great champions have something very different, like the sports champions. And, you know, you have champions in other fields, but you see it more readily in sports. You see it over a weekend or you see it during a game. And you see that certain people stand out and they keep, uh, they keep standing out. But it's there for you. It doesn't take a lifetime to find out that somebody was a winner or a loser. And so the sports thing is very interesting, but... Uh, you know, I play golf with different people and uh, you have, there's a different mindset among champions. There's really a very different mindset. There's a different, uh, there's a different thought process. You know, talent wise, uh, sometimes you can't tell the difference in talent, but at the end of a weekend, they seem to win. And it's very interesting. Uh, what questions would you ask Trump? Um, I would ask him what the, uh, I'd ask him what H2O stands for. Like, what does the H mean? What does the O mean? What does the two mean? I'd ask him to tell me three things about Hezbollah and Lebanon, and three things about Syria, and three things about Iran and the IRGC. Like, I just ask him things like that, you know, just basics. What are the three branch? Yeah, what are the three branches? Uh, like, as an example, uh, Tiger or Jack Nicholas, he was a phenomenal winner. And he does have a different way about him, and Tiger has a different way about him, and Michael Jordan. And there's never one, you would think that there'd be one way, uh, Arnold Palmer. On a more serious, I'd like to ask him why he abandoned the Kurds. That would be interesting. Uh, why would he know about Hezbollah? Because he claims to. He claims that it was because of Biden, that Biden didn't deal with Iran well enough, and that led to Iran coming out of bankruptcy and funding Hezbollah. Like, that's not true, though. Hezbollah slowed down on their buildup on the Israeli border in 2020 because of COVID, not because of funding. 
Like things like that. I don't know. Just ask him things like that. Palmer was the nicest guy you'd ever meet. And then you have some champions that aren't really. What's the difference between arable land and pasture? Like, come on. Really nice. They're just focused on doing their job. Uh, so you have, you know, there's not one type of person. But the one thing I, I would say that everybody seems to have in common is they're very driven. They're driven like beyond. They don't seem to give up easily. They don't give up. They don't give up, but they do seem to be, uh, you know, they have a passion that's maybe more than people that don't do as well. You've said that politics is a dirty game yeah, in the past. It is a dirty game. That's certainly true. Uh, so if it is a game, how do you win at that game? Well, you win at that game by getting the word out and by you using sense. You have to have a feeling where it's going. You also have to have a feeling of what's right. You can't necessarily just go what's popular. You have to do what's good for a country if you're talking about countries. Or, But you, you have to get the word out. And you have to just continuously, like, for instance, you have a great show. You have a great podcast. It's very well watched. And I'm sitting here and I do this. A lot of people see it. And I do other oh. things. And a lot of people... Okay, let's, if you're talking about things that are less combative, but still <laughs> curious, um, I'd want to know... Because you have to think of a few questions to make him not run out of the room, right? So one would be like, you're really proud of Operation Warp Speed. How do you feel about the fact that Republicans are like, <laughs> that Republicans dropped like fucking flies because they don't trust the vaccine? <laughs> that it was mostly your voters who died from COVID. <laughs> I'd word it in a nicer way. But. People see that. And I go traditional also, you know, you have traditional television, which is getting a little bit uh, older and maybe less significant, could be less significant, I don't know. But it's changing a lot. The the uh, The whole plane of, of platform is changing a lot. It's changed a lot in the last two, three years. A lot. But from a political standpoint, you have to find out what people are doing, what they're watching, and you have to get it, you have to get on. I, I just see that these platforms are starting to dominate they're getting very big numbers i did spaces with elon and they got numbers like nobody's ever heard before <laughs> so you know this is you, you wouldn't do that on like radio you wouldn't do that those numbers no matter how good a show you wouldn't do those numbers on radio you wouldn't do them on television what's the clip you've been Hang successful on. in business you've been successful in politics what do you think is the difference between uh, gaining success between the two, the two different disparate worlds. Yeah, and they're different, very different. Um, I have a lot of people that are in business that are Is successful. I think it's this. And There's they'd like to go over to politics. And then you realize- It's this, isn't it? Hang on. Childish nicknames, the crazy conspiracy theories, this weird obsession with crowd sizes. <laughs> it, I remember when Obama was president, like, this was his thing. He did, like, comedy bits. He did... He would do, like, SNL sketches and shit as well. <laughs> it, it just goes on and on and on. The other day I heard someone compare Trump to the neighbor who keeps running his leaf blower outside your window every minute of every day. <laughs> now, from a neighbor, that's exhausting. From a president, it's just dangerous. The, the way he shifts the mood so well, too, like the tone and everything, like that one word, dangerous, like, oh, oh. From a president? Oh, he's going to say something more serious now. Oh, no. What was the, uh, the, everything about this, like the fucking little look down that he does in the face. It's like, it's so. This weird <laughs> obsession with crowd sizes. <laughs> it... Okay. Good. As they can't speak, they choke. You know, it's hard to make a speech in front of that. Let's say you're talking about a big audience, but 
I get very big audiences, and you know, I know how it feels, Bob. One thousand viewers who rated. Thanks, Learner Box. Thanks, Learner Box. Old stream. That <laughs> listen, nothing happened. Okay, nothing to see there. Many people, it's virtually impossible to get up and speak for an hour and a half, and have nobody leave. You know, it's not an easy thing to do, and it's an ability. But I have many people that are very, very successful in business would love to do what I did, and yet they can't pull the trigger. And in many cases, I, I don't think it would work. Almost, almost for everybody, it's not going to work. It's a very, it's a very tough thing to do. It's a big transition. And now, if you talked about people in the business and politics going into business, likewise, that wouldn't generally work out so well either. It's different talents, it's different skills. I have somebody who wants to go into politics so bad, but he's got a little problem. He's got stage fright. Now, cool. he's a total killer, but if he gets up into a stage in front of people, he doesn't do well, to put it mildly, actually. I mean, he does badly. So you have to be able to make he talking about? hard decisions like you do in business, but also be able to captivate an audience. Look, if you're- talking about J.D. Vance. <laughs> politician you have to I'm be sorry. able to speak in front of large crowds there are a lot of people can't do that i've Crowd seen sizes. it they can't even think about doing it and they don't there are many people in business right now i could name them but i don't want to embarrass anybody they've been talking about running for president for 15 years and they're very big in business very well known actually and but it takes guts to run like for musk. president i can tell <laughs> is you is it musk oh god it's musk oh shit you it takes guts to run it's also a very dangerous profession if you want to know the truth but uh, dangerous in a different sense too but it takes a lot of courage to run for president it's not easy but you have and you know the same people as i do there are a lot of people that would like to run for president that are very, very successful in business. Okay, say it again, yeah. But, but they, they don't, don't have the guts to do okay, it. Yeah, okay, and they have to uh, give up a lot. Yeah. One of the great things about wow. people from the business world is they're often great deal makers. And you're a great deal maker. And you've talked about the war in Ukraine and that you would be able to find a deal that both Putin and Zelensky would accept. What do you think that deal looks like? I think the deal, and I, I wouldn't talk about it too much because I think I can make a deal. If if I win as president-elect, I'll have a deal made, guaranteed. That's a war that shouldn't have happened. It's terrible. Look, Biden is the worst president in the history of our country, and she's probably worse than him. Yeah. That's, a, that's something that should have never happened, but it did happen. And now it's a much tougher deal to make than it would have been before it started millions of people millions i think the number is going to be a lot higher when you see this all at some point iron out i think the numbers are going to be the death numbers are going to be a lot higher than Wait, didn't he suggest something about putting chinese flags on american planes in russia hang on there's, there's a no a no fly zone the united states should put chinese flags on f-22 jets and bomb the shit out of russia <laughs> No, he did not say this. Wait, where's the NATO is a paper tiger? Putin wouldn't have invaded if he was president. They were made on Saturday night to laughter. The paper said the former president said, oh, "Okay." In a speech to Republican donors, <laughs> where's the? Hang on, there must be the speech, right? Where the fuck is the speech? What did he actually say? Oh no, it's Washington Post. There must be a video. Is this it? This looks like it. This looks like him. Okay. With the Russia-Ukraine war stretching on, former U.S. President Come Donald on. Trump apparently nope, made that's bomb. No, not it at all. This is just someone narrating. Okay, well, I love that. I love it when that happens. Welcome, welcome, welcome to... This is uh, Jimmy Fallon. Does he have a clip? Any clip? If it's a speech... It was a private event. Okay. Okay. And then we say China did it. We didn't do it. China did it. Then they start fighting with each other and we sit back and watch. No problem. Okay. Then people think when you take a look at the destruction and the buildings 
coming down all over the place in Ukraine. I think those numbers are going to be a lot higher. They they lie about the numbers. They try and keep them low. They knock down a building that's two blocks long. These are big buildings, and they say uh, one person was mildly injured. No, no, a lot of people were killed. And there are people in those buildings, and they have no chance. Once they start coming down, there's no chance. So, so. All right, here it is. Okay, sorry, I lost my shit. Capabilities of the F-35 fighter jet. <laughs> Ninety F-35 aircraft. That's the most sophisticated aircraft in the world. Jet fighters. Total stealth. They're hard to find. They're hard to see. Therefore, they're hard to beat. It's very tough to beat a plane when you can't see it. <laughs> okay, but Trump didn't mean you literally can't see it, right? I mean, he can't think you it's actually invisible, he right? Said this well, that's thing two Let's in see. 60 seconds. Okay. Yeah, come on. That's not enough. That's enough context. Come on. The F-35 stealth fighter jet say? is undetectable by radar. So yeah. when Trump says you can't see it, clearly he means on radar, right? Yeah. Well, here he is. Yeah, here he was yesterday when he misidentified Lockheed Martin CEO Marilyn Houston as Marilyn Lockheed. I may ask Marilyn Lockheed, uh, the leading woman's business executive in this country, according to many, and uh, we buy me when my president's about to try to get me fucking killed. <laughs> Do I trust this man? <laughs> what am I doing here? I feel like my constitution is in trouble and also the life of myself and my family. <laughs> billions and billions of dollars billions. worth of that beautiful F-35. It's stealth. You cannot see it. Is that correct? That's correct. Better That's be good. correct, right? But wait. <laughs> Let's try to give this a charitable interpretation. Trump okay. cannot yeah. possibly oh, saying be saying you literally can't see it. There's so much priming. How do they do in fights with the F-35? Said we do very well. You can't see it. You literally you can't see it. So it's hard to fight a plane that you can't see, right? <laughs> really like that. But that's an expensive plane that you can't see. Well, all righty then. You literally cannot see it. Kind of like a Star Trek cloaking device, which was actually Romulan technology that the Federation used okay, from time okay. to time. Okay, okay, talking about it Or maybe Trump was thinking about Wonder Woman's invisible plane fighter, almost. In particular, the F-35 fighter jet, which is, you know, almost like an invisible fighter. I was asking the Air Force guys, I said, how good is this plane? They said, well, sir, you can't see it. I said, yeah, but in a fight, you know, a fight like I watch on the movies, the fight, they're fighting. <laughs> How good is it? Say, well, it wins every time because the enemy cannot see it. Even if it's right next to it, it can't see it. <laughs> that helps. I no, mean, he thinks they're invisible. Yeah, he thinks they have a fucking sheet, like a like some kind of mirroring device. On the, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. Wait. If Trump. Trump, why not? You, why, you don't even need to put Chinese flags on the F-35s. Just bomb the hell out of Russia with your F-35s because they won't see them, right? His, even his internal logic doesn't make sense. Like, okay. That's a war that absolutely has to get done. And then you have Israel, and then you have a lot of other places that are talking war. The world is, is a rough place right now. And a lot of it's because of the fact that America has no leadership. And I believe that she'll be probably worse than Biden. I watched the interview the other night. I mean, it was just a softball interview. So you would like... Grassroots Hedgemon, thanks for the $5. I'm a conservative and I just want to remind you all I love you. <laughs> I'm sorry this happened to you, Grassroots Hedgemon. I'd like to see her do more interviews, challenged more. I don't know. I, I, I can't believe the whole thing is happening. We had a man in there that should have never been in there. They kept him in a basement. They used COVID. They cheated, but they used COVID to cheat. They, they cheated without COVID too. But uh, you had somebody in there. And now we have a woman that is not, I mean, she couldn't do an interview. This was a really soft interview. This is an interview where they're given a multiple choice uh, questions, multiple guests. I call it multiple guests. 
And uh, I don't think she did well. I think she did very poorly. Okay. How do you think you'll do in the debate coming up? Mm. It's in a few days. So I've done a lot of debating, only as a politician. I never debated. My first debate was the uh, Rosie O'Donnell debate, right? The famous Rosie O'Donnell debate, the answer. Uh, but I've done well with debates. I mean, I became president. Then the second time, I got millions more votes than I got the first time. So I was told if I got 63 million, which is what I got the first time, you 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 would win. You can't not win. And I got millions of more votes than that. Millions. And, uh, Come on, lost Lex. by a whisker. Lex is a... <laughs> Lex has spoken about January 6th before. He's, uh, he sees that as a problem. Go on. We've got election denial. Okay, okay. But, and look what happened to the world with all of the wars and all of the problems and uh, look what happened with inflation, because inflation's just eating up our country, eating it up. So it's too bad. But gobble, gobble. Um, there are a lot of things that could happen. We have to get those wars settled. We have to get, I'll tell you, you have to get Ukraine done. You, that could end up in a third world war. So could the Middle East. So could the. Mind you, this softball interview called out Walls for lying about a DUI. Yeah, they also brought up the fact that it wasn't uh, IVF, wasn't it? It was a different kind of fertility treatment that they used for his kid, right? <laughs> yeah. I wonder if that's uh, going to be, even those two things alone, if those two things alone, I wonder if this is going to be softer than that. If there's anything in this interview that's going to be harsher than that. Maybe. It's only warming up, 11 minutes. Grassroots Hegemon, thanks for the $5. And that fighter pilot was Anakin Skywalker. Fortunately, nothing bad will stem from his success. Okay. In the Thanks. Middle East. So maybe let's talk about what it takes to negotiate with somebody like Putin or, or Zelensky. Do you think Putin would be willing to give up any of the regions they already captured? I don't know. Uh, I can tell you that this, all of this would have never happened, and it would have been very easy because you don't have, like, that question wouldn't be asked. You know, that's a tougher question. Once that starts happening, because he has taken over a lot of territory. Now, I guess they're insurgents now, too, right? So, you know, it's a little bit interesting uh, that that's happening and that it can happen. And it's interesting that Putin has uh, allowed that to happen. Look, that's one that should have should have never started. We have to get it stopped. Ukraine is being demolished. They're they're destroying a great culture that's largely destroyed. What do you think works better in those kinds of negotiations? Leverage of let's say friendship, the carrot or the stick? Friendship or sort of the threat of using the economic and military power? So it depends on who the person is. It's, uh, you know, it's, everyone's different. Negotiation's interesting because it depends on who the person is. And then you have to guess or know through certain knowledge which is, you know, more important, the carrot or the stick. And with some people it's the stick and with some people it's the carrot. Uh, I think the, the stick probably is generally more successful in that, you know, we're talking about war. But... Uh, the kind of destruction that we're witnessing now, nobody's ever seen. I mean, it's it's a terrible thing. And and we're witnessing it all over. We're witnessing it in um, in all parts of the world. And a lot of things are going to get started. Look what's going on with China. China. Look at Japan. They're starting to rearm now. They're starting to rearm because China's getting, you know, taking over certain islands. And um, there's a lot of danger in the war right now in the world. There's a lot of... And there's a great possibility of World War III. And we better get this thing done fast because five months with people like her and him, he's checked out. He just goes to the beach and thinks he looks good in a bathing suit, which he doesn't. Uh, he's sort of checked out. Uh -huh. Hey, look, you know, you can't blame him. That was a coup. They took it over. They took oh, no, over. that's a coup. The presidential... It. It's all the talk about... I, would, I, would, I just want to say... Um, uh, yeah, he's saying it's a problem that Japan's having to arm up because of China, but whatever. Um, you know what? Like, th the fact is, I know that a Republican Trump support would never understand this, but like, foreign policy and events in the world can happen regardless of who's president. Like, that that's a thing, right? Like, American 
has America has a lot of power over foreign policy, but they don't decide the military decisions of other countries. Like they're not necessarily the final fucking frontier of why like Putin making a decision to invade Ukraine or Hezbollah and Hamas taking the decision to attack Israel or whatever. Um, but you know what? Like Trump had it fairly easy, I guess, in terms of foreign policy when he was there because there weren't like, you know, there wasn't the the full on Russian invasion of Ukraine. There was still an invasion. There were still Russian soldiers in Ukraine, right? That was still happening under Trump. But anyway, um, there was still a lot of fighting between uh, Israel and Palestine, but obviously it wasn't October 7th. I really don't like the idea of Trump coming in the way things are now. Because Trump's foreign policy decisions are really erratic and stupid. Like, abandoning the Kurds was immoral and stupid. Pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal was kind of stupid. Saluting Kim, Jong -un, Kim Jong-un's fucking military <laughs> was kind of dumb. Giving him this massive fucking reward in exchange for what? Nothing, basically. Excluding the Afghan government from the negotiations at Doha for the pullout of Afghanistan. Like, I don't really know Trump actually did quite a bit of damage with not that much. No response to the uh, fucking Iranian attack on was it uh, Saudi Arabia? Like, fuck, I I don't know. I feel like uh, putting him in this kind of situation, like with this much volatility, that's really scary. <laughs> I just don't like to think about the, th the kind of things Trump would like to do or would the kind of lengths he would go to to get a deal in Ukraine, for example, or to even end the war in Gaza. Yeah. The whole presidential thing was taken over in a coup. He had 14 million votes. He had no votes, not one. And nobody thought it was going to be her. Nobody wanted it to be her. She was a, a joke until six weeks ago when they said we're going to have to, politically, they felt they had to pick her. Abraham Accords, the fact is, is that, first of all, the Abraham Accords are just basically a realization, okay? That everyone knew this already. Everyone knew that countries like Saudi or Morocco or whatever were not going to go to war with Israel. Everyone knew that they were basically on the road to normalization anyway. And the thing that the Abraham Accords basically unearthed was like this truth that everyone was already aware of, but just didn't formalize it, is that these other Arab countries, like the Gulf states especially, never gave a fuck about the Palestinian question. Like, that's, that's it. Like, they were willing, like, it's funny that you think about like Arafat saying, I don't want to give up the Temple Mount because I might get shot, right? Or I don't even want to, even if you give me the Temple Mount, but you give me on the condition that I have to recognize that there was a Jewish temple underneath it, I might get shot for that as well. You know, the Muslim world cares, the Muslim world cares a lot about the Temple Mount. Okay, I can't do it. My hands are tied. It's funny that Arafat said all that, but then what was the uh, Arab response? Or how did it affect the Abraham Accords for Trump to move the embassy to Jerusalem? What the f*** happened? Like, not, what, what happened? <laughs> I feel like the Arab response to that was fairly sanguine. Like, they didn't really do that much. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like people already knew this. It's just, again, a lot of these foreign policy decisions, it doesn't really matter who's in power at the time. Sometimes it matters, but not always. And I think the extent to which it matters is often exaggerated. Yeah. yeah. And didn't move in the embassy to Jerusalem her, spark they... the Great March of Return riots. I think they were definitely part of it. Yeah, it also actually led to a lot of. Uh, that's partly what emboldened Ben Gavir to take his fucking droogs up to the Temple Mount to start fucking uh, rioting, to start causing, to start vandalizing Al Aqsa. Right, like that was and causing all those fights. Yeah, that was um, that was partly emboldened by the uh, by Trump moving the embassy. Yeah. So. Hmm. They thought there'd be a, a problem. And you know, Operation Alaxa Flood. It's called Alaxa Flood. Eh? Just saying. Just asking questions. I don't know if that's right or not. I actually don't think it's right, but you know, they, they thought it was right. And now immediately the press comes to their aid. If we can go back to China on negotiations. Oh, sorry, one more thing. One more thing about that. Um God, I'm so happy I've I did this. Even for, even doing this for two days, so much more valuable. Like reading uh, like a shit ton of articles 
first thing in the morning before I start streaming. Uh, there was one article I read about, uh, did you see this, that the IDF had captured documents from Gaza that were verified by the New York Times about their tunnel schemes. About I think it was like a bunch of documents, some of which were signed off on by Sinwar himself, allocating funding and uh, giving the, the green light for tunnel building projects around Gaza. Um, that this was a, docu a bunch of documents from 2019 that basically shows Hamas building up their tunnel network and adding things that they hadn't used in previous wars, like uh, like blast doors, blast doors in the tunnel system that can withstand like grenades and shit like that or explosives, and uh, also like mechanisms inside the tunnel so that they can collapse uh, and cave in at certain points if to stop soldiers from advancing. So if you're like on the retreat, you can just make sure that your part of this tunnel blows up at this point so that the soldiers can't advance. So you've still got your tunnel, the parts that you're using, but the soldiers can't get any further. Like the, all these things that, like the basically improvement of their tunnel system and the extensiveness of it as well. Uh, this was all found in this in these documents with uh, Sinwar's approval um, that even in 2019, it was quite clear that Hamas were building up their tunnel system to prepare for an invasion. Like they were anticipating an invasion and they were fortifying themselves to a greater extent than they had in previous wars because they were, ex even then they had something in mind that might anticipate an idea of ground invasion. Even in 2019, when Trump was still president. So the fact that that kind of level of preparation and that level of foresight exists even four years before October 7th, yeah, that it shows you again that just because an attack happens on October 2023, that doesn't tell you exactly when they decided to attack or when they were considering attacking. Um, yeah, I learned a lot from reading that article. Uh, I learned that it costs about $300,000 to dig half a mile of tunnel. Half a mile. So that's what, $6 million for 10 miles? 60 million for 100. It's not even that expensive. I also had a thought. When people speak about the unemployment rate in Gaza before October 7th, did the, did the unemployment rate include people who were digging tunnels? How many people would it have taken? Because I think the estimates, I don't think it would have accounted for anywhere near like whatever the 50% unemployment, but um, they were investing quite a lot in, in these projects. And not, that's not even to mention fortifying the tunnels. They probably use slave force. That's not true either. I know that um, al Qassam fighters dig tunnels as well because in their obituaries for al Qassam fighters, what they're doing during ceasefire time, for example, is they will talk about their uh, missions and a lot of the missions, are, some people are assigned to digging tunnels. Yeah. If not, maybe they're overseeing. I don't know. So um, actually one of the deaths... <laughs> of the al Qassam brigades uh, for one of their fighters was actually someone who died because the tunnel they were digging caved in. That's actually one of the obituaries on the Hamas website. Maybe go and find it one day. Um, I also learned, so I think the estimates that they have for the length of tunnels that they have currently under Gaza is it's, it's generally now understood to be much higher than what they expected before they went in. Um, some estimates are now around 250 miles of tunnel. Other estimates are actually people saying that might be twice as much as that. So yeah, that was, I know like some of the tunnels are 70 meters deep, like, like a 70 story, like a, like a 20 story building deep. Um, when people say, when people like Finkelstein scoff at that idea because Gaza is only so many square miles, was it like 140 square miles? Yeah. Finkelstein scoffs at the idea of there being 250 square mile, uh, 250 miles of tunnel under Gaza because it's only 141 square miles. I'm like, that's so stupid. If you don't know how uh, like square miles work, you know, um, like the Paris Metro is like 130 miles of rail in an area that's only 40 square miles. I, and those are for trains, not tunnels, not like single file tunnels for dudes with Kalashnikovs and laptops. But long story short, long story short, it seemed like Hamas were anticipating ground forces and building up their tunnel network to absorb a ground attack, even as early as 2019. So, yeah. 
and Sinwar was involved in that process. So, okay, just saying. And Trump was president at that time. And it just happened, to, 2019 just happens to be the year when Trump was like, after Trump had moved the embassy to Jerusalem. So, yeah, okay. How do we have avoid but that would also make it would also be foolish to say that trump caused october 7th because these groups have their own agency they have their own autonomy they make their own decisions right some of it's maybe influenced a little bit by american foreign policy but they also have their own internal logic that doesn't that isn't dictated by what the president's saying okay or with china in the 21st century well there are ways now here's the problem if i tell you how and i'd love to do it but if I, if I give you a plan, like I have a very exacting plan how to stop Ukraine and Russia. Okay. And I have a certain idea, maybe not a plan, but an idea for China. Because we do, we, you know, we're, gonna, we're in a lot of trouble. They'll be in a lot of trouble too. But we're in a lot of trouble. You happen to be an F-35 pilot in uh, America? I would seriously reconsider, I would consider deserting if Trump becomes president. I'm just saying, okay? Like, I would really reconsider your role in the military because Trump is going to overestimate the actual shit out of, he will fly you right over the most sophisticated anti-aircraft technology in the fucking world. He will throw you straight into a dogfight on your own because he thinks you can just kind of snoop around like a fucking ghost, <laughs> sniping all of them. I'd be really careful, okay? F-35 pilots, you watch the fuck out, okay? Because this guy... <laughs> uh, but I can't give you those plans because if I give you those plans, I'm not going to be able to use them. They'll be very unsuccessful. You know, part of it's surprise, right? Right. But they won't be able to help us much. So you have a plan of what to say to Putin Yeah, I know. take exactly. office. No, I had a very good relationship with him and I had a good relationship with Zelensky too, but... I had a very good relationship with Putin. Tough topic, but important. You said lost by a whisker. Uh-oh. Uh, I'm an independent. I have a lot of friends who are independent, many of whom like your policies, uh, like the fact that you're a deal maker, like the fact that you can end wars, but they are troubled by uh, what happened in the 2020 election and... Uh, statements about widespread fraud and this kind of stuff, fake elector scheme. What can you say to those uh, independent voters to help them decide? Yes, he did, he did threaten Zelensky, yes, because he wanted to get dirt on fucking Hunter Biden or whatever, yeah. <laughs> he was impeached. <laughs> he was impeached for it. Okay. Who to vote right. for. I think the fraud was on the other side. I think Ooh. the election was a fraud. And many people felt it was that, and they wanted answers. And when you can't challenge an election, you have to be able to challenge it. Otherwise, it's going to get worse, not better. And there are lots of ways to solve this problem. Go to paper ballots and do it the easy way. I mean, the paper ballots and you uh, have voter ID and you have same-day voting and you have proof of citizenship, which is very important because we have people voting that are not citizens. They just came in. And they're loading it's up. Still lying. What the f the payrolls. They're loading up everything. They're putting students in schools. They don't speak a word of English, and they're taking the seats of people that are citizens of our country. So he challenged it dozens of times and lost. Not only that, he paid millions of dollars for some of these recounts as well. He's still lying. Come on, Lex. Come on. Everyone knows this is not true. Everyone. Everyone knows. If you look at the evidence that they use, it is so miserable. Like, have we watched like one of the examples? We have, haven't we? We watched the Fulton County video. We've watched the three minute video versus the context. And the fact that Giuliani literally lost his fucking license to practice law <laughs> over it because they said that there's no way anyone of sound mind could have watched that full footage and, uh, believe that the three minute summary was like reasonable we watched that and we did we watch the uh his suspension did we read the suspension that maybe i did this off stream in any case this is uh giuliani having his law license revoked from new york state they mentioned the fulton county video which is like the one of the big smoking guns that the republicans were using because it's a video and you have ruby freeman the uh political the professional balloteer 
or whatever the fuck Trump called her. They say here, um, Giuliani actually said that he reviewed the entire video. The video where they literally show you them putting the ballot box under the table and sealing it. And they cut that bit out to make it look like it was a mystery ballot box pulled out from under the table in the middle of the night. <laughs> Even though all the observers are there when they are sealing the ballot box and putting it underneath to close for the night. But he still thought the OAN summary was fair. Where is it they say that? Let's see. There's a quote here. If, as respondent claims, he reviewed the entire video, he could not have reasonably reached the conclusion that illegal votes were being counted. We disagree that the video can be viewed as evidence of illegal conduct during the vote tabulation process or that it provided a reasonable basis for respondents' conclusions. Like the, and this was one of their biggest examples. The votes under the table. It was, it was nothing. It was so clearly, deliberately fabricated. Oh, God. It pissed me off, man. People that are citizens of our country. So, uh, look, we have look. the worst border in the history of the world. Oh, okay. We have coming into our country right now millions and millions of people at levels that nobody's ever seen. I don't believe any country's ever seen it. And they would use sticks and so stones not to make I it happen, like not to so. let it happen. We don't, we don't do anything. And we have a person who was the border czar who now said she wasn't really the border czar, but she was. She was the border czar, but she was in charge of the border. And we have her, and she's saying uh, very strongly, oh, I did such a good job. She was yeah, I don't think there's any evidence of this, but okay. I thought we were talking about the election. Lex, bring it back. There's a, this section is quite long, isn't it? This section goes on for another... Seven minutes. Horrible, horrible. The the harm she's done. But we have people coming in from other countries all over the world, not just South America. And they're coming in from prisons and jails. They're coming in from mental institutions and insane Who killed the asylums. border bill? That's a good question. And they're street criminals. Right off the street, they take them. And they're being given to our country. D drug dealers, human traffickers. We're destroying our country. This is a sin what's been allowed to take place over the last four years. We're just 1.5 speed it uh, for free. Sorry. What? Destroying our country. Hannibal Lecter. And we'll see how that all works out. But it's not even believable. And now you see, you saw in Aurora, Colorado, uh, a group of very tough young thugs from Venezuela. <laughs> oh, no. Taking over big areas including buildings <laughs> they're taking over buildings they have their we watched this it took 15 seconds it took 15 seconds to see the video of the police <laughs> in the building saying this building has not been taken over what the fuck are you talking about two days ago venezuelan gang activity in aurora this week, Aurora has been in the national spotlight as videos have been circulating on social media showing gangs Where is it? are our cops. cops. Anything state is Look, there they are. evidence to show that gang is connected to crimes in the area. They shared this, this the video this last night Fox. of officers looking into claims at the edge of Lowry Apartments. APD's interim police chief Heather Morris says gang members have not taken over the complex and they're reassuring the community they Bro. are investigating criminal activity. We are actively investigating criminal activity that's happening and listening to them to uh, so that we can learn any anything that we're missing. You know, what are we missing and actually find out what exactly is going on. Governor Jared Polis spoke with CNN saying the state is ready to step in at a moment's notice if Aurora in Aurora if needed and adding that the state takes these kinds of threats very seriously. But he says Aurora officials have not raised that alarm. So all we await is a call from Aurora saying there's any building in the control of any gang and we are ready to help take it back. That call has not happened because Aurora police does not currently believe or they haven't told us that there's any buildings in control of gangs. Aurora's mayor, Mike Kaufman, <laughs> on the other. This is completely fabricated. Like, it's so funny, man. Why? How does he get away with this? Where does it... It's the fact that this future president, <sighs> potentially, is like... He's gonna. He gets his updates sitting on the fucking shitter, looking at tweets. Elon Musk's Twitter, bro. Big rifles. 
but they're taking over buildings. We're not going to let this happen. We're not going to let them destroy our country. And you know, when those countries- They finally discovered how to dog whistle though, because round one, it's like they actually, they went, have you not noticed that the Republican Party have effectively just run through the entire history of the Southern strategy in a few weeks? You know the Southern strategy? You say the N-word a lot, then you're like, whoa, that backfires. Now we talk about gangsters and thugs. Like, they spent the first week or two saying that Kamala was a fake black woman, or is she Indian or black, or wait, what is even mixed race? I don't know. I'm just going to pretend to forget. And then going after, like, the crazy cat ladies or whatever else. Then that looks kind of bad. And now they're on phase two. They've gone Southern strategy. Well, black vice president. Okay, uh... Let's find one video of a ga of a gang harassing some people in a fucking house and say that gangs are taking over the building. They're doing the Southern strategy. They have just gone from N-word to dog whistle. <laughs> but they've had to relearn it. They've had to take a fucking fast track course in the Southern strategy <laughs> since Kamala became the candidate for the presidency. Bro, that's really impressive, actually. They did it on full fucking display. What the fuck? Let this happen. We're not going to let them destroy our country. And you know, in those countries, crime is way down. They're taking them out of their prisons, which is good because good for them. I do yeah, the same thing. Yeah. Do By all the way, of it now. All of it. Always. She's a black woman. Okay. Let's just everything. Crime. Associated with, the fuck with crime. Crime and communism. I love it that they had to skip over that. They had to they had to cross the hurdle of DEI hire fake black women before they realized that actually you can just talk about crime. <laughs> like, oh God. Wait, if I ran one of those countries, any country in the world, I would make sure that America has every one of our prisoners. Every one of our criminals would be here. I can't believe they're going so slowly, but some aren't. And but they all are doing it. And we can't let that happen. They're emptying out their prisons and their mental institutions into the United States of America. We can't let that happen. So a lot of people believe that there was some shady stuff that went on with the election, whether okay, it's bring uh, it back. media bias or big tech, but still the, the claim of widespread fraud is the thing that bothers people. Well, I'm not I don't focus on the past. Turned into a red mist solves the issue but people have a very real emotional attachment to the butcher of Khan's Yunus. In the same way killing bin Laden wasn't important at the time it occurred, but it was emotionally important for Americans. Well, goddamn, thanks for the hundred dollars. Now I know why you're a conservative. <laughs> you got money. <laughs> Thank you, I really appreciate it. You're, thanks for subsidizing the entire stream today. Um, eh, I, I don't know, like... I feel like if it's anything like, you know, when Israelis talk about we, we've dismantled some battalions, yeah, we got rid of, there's 24 battalions and 22 of them have been fucked up. Like, that works if they're a normal battalion, because a normal battalion, they lose like 30 or 40 percent of their guys or their equipment, and they're basically non-functional. They don't, like, the whole is much greater than the sum of its parts for a battalion. But if it's Hamas, Hamas is, they're not a conventional military. They're between a conventional military and a guerrilla group. So if their battalions get dismantled, they can split up into little cells and uh, like interdependent or independent units. Like They can survive quite well doing that. And also they can recruit a bunch of new people as they go along as well. Um, I wonder if that applies to their leadership as well. I think it probably does. It might help Israeli morale. How long were you in the army? Um, currently. I'm still in the process of invading your mom's fanny, consensually. But apart from that, I've never been in the military, no. Uber, thanks for the $5. I'm starting to believe Giuliani just rounded up a bunch of Italian dudes and claimed to take down the mafia. You know what? Maybe. I, I really apologize to the woman in chat to, for that joke. All three of you. Beanpod, thanks for the tier one sub. And Marcus, thanks for the 30 shekels here. Now put him on 1.5 before we die of boredom. I didn't say how much it would cost. Okay, fine. I'm gonna go 1.25, compromise, okay. I focus on the future. I mean, I talk about how bad the economy is, how bad inflation is, how bad things like, um, which is important. Afghanistan was 
in my opinion, the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to our country. And because of that, I think Putin went in. Okay, nice said, dodge. How stupid Wait, we were. how did he dodge the, the voter fraud thing? Also, Lex asking that in the very soft way. But. Is how bad things like, um, which is important, Afghanistan, just I focus on the future. I mean, I... Heck. But still, the the claim of widespread fraud is the thing that bothers people. Well, I don't focus on the past. I focus on the future. I mean, I talk about how bad the economy is, how bad inflation. He talks about, he brought up the election in this interview. He talks about it all the fucking time. He still says he won the election. Or if he says he lost, it's only because they cheated with COVID and without COVID and with illegals and whatever. What? Okay. Gaslight. It is how bad things like, um, which is important. Afghanistan was, in my opinion, the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to our country. And because of that, I think Putin went in when he said how, how stupid we were. Putin went in. But it, it was the most embarrassing moment in the history of our country. I really believe that. But, you know, we left. We left. Remember a deal which you kind of organized, right? The pullout that you organized? The you know, when you excluded the Afghan government from the talks and released a bunch of Taliban prisoners and left them in an incredibly vulnerable position, hmm, but didn't actually have the courage to proceed with the pullout yourself. Needed a real man, Joe Biden, to do it for you, <laughs> to take the blow. Hmm. Hmm. 13 dead soldiers. Think of it, 13 dead soldiers. Many soldiers horrifically hurt with arms and legs and everything else gone. Um, we left hostages behind. We left Americans behind. We left military equipment, the likes of which nobody's ever left behind before. Billions and billions of dollars of equipment. They're now selling the equipment. They're one of the largest arms dealers in the world. And uh, very sad, very sad. And, and you know, we were there for a long time. I was going to get out. We were getting ready to get out. Then we got interrupted by the election. But we would have been out with dignity and strength. Uh, we were having very little problem with the Taliban when I was there because they knew it was going to be tough. I dealt with Abdul. Abdul was the leader. And we got along fine. He understood. But, you know, they were shooting. <laughs> we they had were... a great relationship, me and the Taliban leader. <laughs> a great relationship. He's a, he's a great guy. <laughs> Tremendous person. <laughs> I like the Taliban government too, the, Af the Afghan government. The ones we supported for 20 years. Just not enough to invite them to the meetings, you know. <laughs> okay. We're killing a lot of our people before I came down. And when I got there, I said, I spoke to him. I said, you can't do it. Don't do it anymore. We went 18 months before this happened, this horrible day happened. We went 18 months and nobody was shot at or killed. What do you think that was? The carrot or the stick in that case in Afghanistan? The stick. Worked? Definitely. So the the threat of it was the fucking carrot. You gave them what they wanted, you fucking lying snake cunt. Like, what? Is, is the stick excluding the Afghan government from the talks? What? Another thing uh, people don't actually know that much about with Trump is he also actually relaxed the rules of engagement in Afghanistan for strikes, for airstrikes. And that resulted, that is the stick. You know what it resulted in? Um... It resulted in an increase in civilian deaths, 2017, 2020, because they relaxed the rules of engagement for airstrikes and resulted in an increase in civilian casualties, which, you know, not good when you're trying to prop up a government that depends on civilian support, <laughs> at least in part. And you want to drive people into the Taliban. There was some general, I can't remember his name, some American general who was literally like, we're going to lose this fucking war because we keep killing civilians. Um, I guess he was right. Is it this one? Oh, General McChrystal. What is it we don't understand? We're going to lose this fucking war if we don't stop killing civilians. And then Trump relaxed the rules of engagement and got more civilians killed. Terry Force. That was the stick, yeah. Yes, That's they did release 5,000 uh, Taliban prisoners, yes. It doesn't have to be, but that was the stick. Well, let me just linger on the election a little, a little bit more. For this election, it might be a close one. What can we do to avoid the insanity and division of the previous election, whether you win or lose? Well, I hope it's not a close one. I mean, you know, I don't know how people can vote for somebody that has destroyed our country. The inflation, the bad economy, but but to me, in a way, the worst is what they've allowed to happen at our border, where they've allowed millions of people to come millions. in here from places that you don't want to know about. 
And I, I can't... have no idea where he's getting millions from. Is there even a number? Hang on. Number. Is he talking about number of border encounters and assuming that's just millions of people coming into the United States? I think he's just counting encounters. And then even then, he's exaggerating the numbers because I've heard him say like over 10 million, <laughs> which is. Even then, though, border encounters, yeah, that's like less than a million a year. And that was during COVID. Huh. But he thinks that's people who have been let in and are, I guess, going to vote in the next election. <laughs> okay. I believe that there's going to be a close election. You know, we're leading in the polls, but, and it looks close, but I think in the end, it's not going to be a close election. What do you think is the right way to solve the immigration crisis? Is mass deportation one of the solutions you would think about? Well, you've got to get the, the criminals out of here fast, right? You, fast. you know, the people from mental institutions, you got to get them back into their mental institution. No country can afford this. You know, it's just too much money. You look at what's happening in New York and Chicago and LA and lots of places, and you take a look at what's happening. There's no country can afford this. We can't afford it. And we've got to get the bad ones out immediately, and the rest have to be worked on. You know, it's happened before. Dwight Eisenhower was sort of a moderate president, moderate type person, but he hated when he saw people pouring into the country, and they were. Nothing like now. You know, I probably got elected in 2016 because of the border. And I told people what was happening, and they understood it. And I won the election, and I won the election, I think, because of the border. Our border is 25 times worse right now than it was in 2016. Hmm. What is an asylum seeker? That's a question Lex should ask Trump. What is an asylum seeker? What's the asylum process? What are you supposed to do if you want to claim asylum in the United States? Can we, that would be a good question. I had it fixed. I had it the last week of my, the famous chart that I put up was exactly that. You know the chart? When I looked to the right, I said, there's the chart. Being, uh, that was not a pleasant experience. But the chart that I put up said, and that was done by Border Patrol, that was the lowest number that we've ever had come into our country in recorded history. And we have to get it back to that again. We will. Let me ask you about Project 2025. So you've publicly said that you don't have any direct connection to Project Nothing. I know nothing about it. And they know that too. Democrats mm. know that. And I purposely haven't read it because I want to say to you, I don't. I have no idea I, what I do believe he might think an asylum seeker is a mentally insane person <laughs> who is let out of the asylum and sent to the United States. You know, the same way that Castro sent a bunch of criminals over to fucking Florida, <laughs> like in Scarface. I wonder if he actually believes that. I, hmm, I, I Hannibal Lecter, yeah, like Buffalo Bill. <laughs> okay. It's all about, it's easier than saying- Someone I should just ask him. Can someone please just ask him what an asylum secret? Has no one in his campaign staff been like, Mr. President, okay, I, know, I, don't, I don't mean to be insulting, okay? <laughs> You're a very smart person, the smartest kind, the best. I'm rooting for you. Can we just sit down and talk about what an asylum seeker is? <laughs> We're gonna just give you a 10 minute breakdown of the asylum process, asylum stats. Not even stats, no, no more. Answer. Just what an asylum seeker is, please. I read it and you know, all of the things. No, I purposely haven't read it. And I've heard about it. I've heard about things that are in there that I don't like. And there's some things in there that everybody would like. But there are things that uh, I don't like at all. And I think it's uh, unfortunate that they put it out, but it doesn't mean anything because it has nothing to do with me. Project 25 has, it has absolutely nothing to do with me. You posted recently about marijuana and uh, that you're okay with it being legalized, but it has to be done safely. Can you explain your policy there? Well, I just put out a paper. And first of all, medical marijuana has been amazing. It's been I, I've had friends and I've had others and doctors telling me that it's been absolutely mm -hmm. amazing, the medical marijuana. And we put out a statement that we can live with the marijuana. It's got to be a certain age, got to be a certain age to buy it. Uh, it's got to be done in a very concerted, lawful way. And the way they're doing it in Florida, I think, is going to be actually good. It's going to be very good. But it's got to be done in a good way. It's got to be done in a clean way. You go into some of these places, like in New York, it's all it smells all marijuana. You can't the way you've got to have a system where there's control. And I think the way they've done it in Florida is very good. Do you know anything about psychedelics? So I'm I'm not a drug guy, but I recently did ayahuasca. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of people that speak to sort of the health benefits and the spiritual benefits 
of these different psychedelics. Right. I think uh, we would probably have a better world if everybody in Congress took some mushrooms, perhaps. Um, now I know you don't, you stay away from all of that stuff. Um, I, I know also veterans use it for dealing with PTSD and all that kind of stuff. So it's right. it's great and it's oh, interesting no. that you're thinking about being more accepting. It's funny because the next segment yeah, is called Joe Rogan. Anyway. You know, some of these drugs, which don't just have a recreational purpose, but uh, a medical purpose, yeah. a treatment purpose. So we put out a statement today. We're going to put out another one probably next week, be more specific, although I think it's pretty specific. And we'll, uh, we'll see how that all goes. That's a referendum coming up in some states, but mm. it's coming up and we'll see how it does. I will say it's been very hard to beat it. Uh, you take a look at the numbers, it's been very hard to beat it. So I think it'll generally pass, but you want to do it in a safe way. Speaking of marijuana, let me ask you about my good friend, Joe Rogan. So you had a bit of tension with him. Uh oh. So when he said nice things about RFK Jr., I think <laughs> you've, uh, you've said some not so nice things about Joe. And I think that was a bit unfair. That was so and funny. And as a fan of Joe J Rogan and Kyle Rittenhouse were just such a good illustration of how much of a fucking cult the MAGA movement is. It was just such a good illustration of how much intimidation that they use to get people to do what they want. It's so funny. Joe, I would love to. What's the most that's ever been donated in a live stream? Um, there was definitely one time when the bar went to $1,000, but I don't know if it was carrying over the previous day. I think it was about $1,000. Yeah. To see you do his podcast because <laughs> he is legit the greatest conversationalist in the world. So yeah. what's what's the story behind well, the tension? Though? I don't think there was any tension. And uh, I've always liked him, but I don't know him. I mean, I only see him when I walk into the arena with Dana mm -hmm. and I shake his hand. I see him there and I think he's good at what he does, but I don't know about doing Written this podcast. House. I mean, Written house. Remember. Remember how Rittenhouse had to learn the hard way because no, Rittenhouse was actually like, he was categorical. He was like, I want to support Ron Paul because of the second amendment. He's the only one who'll defend the second amendment. And one day later, after getting berated, losing tens of thousands of followers, getting fucking threats, getting transvestigated, <laughs> he was getting trans, people were trying to figure out if he was trans, bro. Kyle. And then he flipped back. He gave up. He gave up the struggle just like that. Where is it? I mean, I guess I do it, but I haven't been asked and I'm not asking them, you know? I'm not asking anybody. It sounds like a challenging negotiation situation. No, it's, it's, not, it's not really a negotiation. And he's sort of a liberal guy, I guess, you know, from what I understand. But he likes Kennedy. This was before I found this out, before Kennedy came in with us. He's gonna be great. He's doing, Bobby's gonna be great. But I like that he likes Kennedy. I do too. You know, he's a different kind of a guy, but he's got some great things going. And uh, mm -hmm. I think this he's going to be on politics. Trump I think now, he could yeah. be okay. quite influential in taking care of some situations that you probably would agree should be taken care of. The Joe Rogan post is an example. I would love to get your psychology uh, about behind the tweets and the post on truth. Uh, are you sometimes being intentionally provocative or are you just speaking your mind? Mm -hmm. And are there times where you regret some of the truths yeah. you've posted. Yeah, I do. I mean, but not that often, honestly. You know, I do a lot of reposting. The ones you get in trouble with are the reposts because you find down deep they're into some group that uh, you're not supposed to be reposting. You don't even know if those groups One of are... the things he reposted up to January 6th was someone who actually revealed the the scheme, the fake collector scheme. <laughs> like basically the Eastman memo, but just from some outsider <laughs> who was saying what should be done. And he had to delete it afterwards. Here it is. This is Kyle. This was uh this was Kyle the day after saying <laughs> the day after suggesting he would vote for Ron Paul to protect the Second Amendment. Poor guy, man. Was it an an alt account of Chess Bro? Oh, I think it was. Cheese bro. Cheese bro alt account. Yeah, I think so. Bro. Huh. Good, bad, or indifferent. But the reposts are the ones that really get you in trouble. When you do your own words, it's sort of easier. But the reposts are very quickly. This is Hegemon's caretaker. Please time him out. This is supposed to be his September groceries allowance. Oh, no. Is he an asylum seeker? Is that what this is? 
He's out of the asylum and looking for an American one. <laughs> he wants to up, upgrade his asylum to from Mexican to American. Huh. And if you're going to check every single little Thanks for $10, symbol, James Socks. Appreciate that. And uh, I don't know. It's worked out pretty well for me, I tell you. it's uh, Truth is very powerful. Truth. And it's my platform, and it's been very powerful. Mm. Very, very powerful. It goes everywhere. I call it my typewriter. You know, that's actually my typewriter. What are you doing usually when you're composing a truth? Like, are you chilling back on a couch? Couches, beds. Okay. A lot of different things. I mean. Like late at night? And just, just I'd like it. to do some later. You know, I don't, I'm not a huge sleeper, I, but whenever I do them, um, you know, past like three o'clock, mm -hmm. they criticize you the next day. Trump was up, true thing, okay? Trump was true thing at three o'clock in the morning, and there should be no problem with that. And then when you think about time zones, how do they know that you're like, you know, in a time zone, like an Eastern zone? So, but but every time I do it after like two or three o'clock, it's like, why is he doing that? But it's gotten, um, I mean. You know, the truth has become a very successful uh, platform, and I like doing it. And it goes everywhere. As soon as I do it, it goes everywhere. The country seems more divided than ever. Yeah. What can you do to help alleviate some of that division? Well, you can get rid of these two people. They're terrible. They're terrible. <laughs> you don't want to have them running this country. They're not equipped to run it. Joe, just Joe, it's a disaster. Okay. And Kamala, I think she'll end up being worse than him. Mm. We'll see. I think a lot's now, you know, the convention's over with, and I, I see I'm leading in just about all the polls now. They had their little honeymoon period, as they call it. And we'll see how that all goes, who knows. From my personal opinion, I think you, you are at your best when you're talking about a positive vision of the future versus criticizing the other side. Yeah. I think you have to criticize, though. I think, I think they're nasty. They came up with mm. a story that I looked down and I called soldiers that died in World War I. Suckers and losers. I guess okay. basically there were like four people there with him who verified that he said this, but okay. Now, number one, who would say that? Number two, who would say it to military people? Nobody. It was a made-up story. It was just a he made fun of uh, McCain for getting captured. So why wouldn't you? Okay. Made-up story. And they like to repeat it over again. They know it was made up. I have 26 witnesses that nothing was said. They don't want to hear about that. Uh, like she lied on McDonald's. She said that... Are these witnesses or were these just people who had seen him that day? <laughs> hmm. Uh, that she worked at McDonald's. It's not a big lie, but it's a big lie. It's so, you know, I mean, they just went and they checked. And unless she can show something, they don't talk about it. The presses are going to follow up with it, but I, I'll keep hammering it. But she never worked at McDonald's. It was just, a you know, sort of a cool thing to say, hey, I worked at McDonald's, you know. Um, but one of the worst was two days ago, I went to Arlington at the request of people that lost their children. There'll always be children to those people. You understand that. That's not politically incorrect a thing to say. The mother comes up, I lost my child. But, you know, the child is a soldier. And lost the child because of Biden and because of mm. Kamala. As, just as though they had the gun in their hand because it was so badly handled. It should have been done at Bagram, which is the big air base. It shouldn't have been done at a small little airport right in the middle of town where people stormed it. Uh, it was a true disaster. And they asked me if I'd come and celebrate with them three years, three years. They died three years ago. And I said, I'm going to try. I got to know them because I brought them here, actually. One night, they, they almost all came here. And they said, I wonder if Trump will actually come and see us. I heard they were here. I came, set, so we stayed for like four hours listening to music up on a deck right upstairs. Beautiful. And they were great people. So they called me over the last couple of weeks and they said, we're going to have a reunion, our three-year reunion. Would you be able to come? And it was very hard for me to do it logistically, but I said, I'll get it done. Did he say celebrate? <laughs> do Americans use that word? <laughs> Commemorate. When, okay. And I got there. And we had a beautiful uh, okay. time. I didn't run away. I didn't, you know, I didn't just walk in, shake hands and walk in <laughs> like people do. And I wasn't looking at my watch like Joe Biden does. And it was amazing. So I did it for them. I didn't do it for me. I don't need the publicity. I mean, I get more publicity probably than anybody. You would know that better than me, but I think maybe more than anybody, maybe more than anybody that's ever lived. I don't know, but I don't think anyone could have any more. Every time you turn on television, there's like nine different- That's where at Kabul Airport- not some small port. Okay.
I, I can't keep up. <laughs> ever lived? I don't know, but I don't think anyone can. Yeah, it was Cabo International, yeah. Have anymore. Every time you turn on television, there's like nine different stories all on different topics in the world of that stuff. As an example, you interview a lot of people, good people, successful people. Let's see how you do with this interview versus them, okay? I mean, I, I can tell you right now, you're going to get the highest numbers you've ever had by sometimes a factor of 10. But, but yes, um, the numbers. When a gold star family asks me to come in and spend time with them, and then they said, sir, we did a ceremony, and then we went down to the graves, which was quite a distance away. They said, sir, would you come to the grave? And then they said when we were there, it's very sad, actually, because these people shouldn't have died. They shouldn't have died. They died because of Biden and because of Kamala. They died because it's just like if they pulled the trigger, okay? Now, I don't know if that's controversial Ooh. to say, but I don't think it is. Afghanistan was the most incompetently run operation, I think. God, I've he's such an unbelievable piece of shit. And the fact that the fact that you can't allow someone to talk about this without letting the audience know that this timeline was set by Trump. That the disadvantages the Afghan government were placed under were in large part because of Trump. Because Trump pressured the Afghan government to release 5,000 prisoners from the Taliban and that they excluded them from the talks. I've ever seen military or otherwise, they're incompetent. But the families asked me if I'd go. I did go. Then the family said, could we have a picture at the tombstone of my son? And we did. Son or daughter. There was a daughter too. Just like they pulled the trigger. Holy shit. Oh, what a disgusting piece of shit. Fuck me. He's actually, he's actually like a pathetic, like horrible, vain, miserable cunt, isn't he? Like, he's just such a, he's just horrible in every fucking way. Like, I feel like conservatives don't really get that side of things. Like, it's not just that, because conservatives, uh, yeah, whatever, they don't care about policy or they want to block the border or whatever the fuck else. But at the end of the day, this guy is just a bad person. He's, a, he's an indecent person. He's like all the things a conservative tries to get their child like not to be, you know? Not humble, he's not Christian, he's not fucking well-behaved, he's like miserable fucking... Uh, personal life with his marriages and everything and the fucking Stormy Daniels thing and mocks veterans and then lies habitually. Like, come on. Fuck. And I took numerous pictures with the families. I don't know if anybody else was in the pictures, but they were mostly families, I guess. That was it. And then I left. I spent a lot of time with them. Then I left and I get home that night and I get a call that the Biden administration with Kamala is accusing me of using Arlington for publicity. I was in use. Just the opposite. Just the opposite. And, and actually, did you see, it just came out, the families actually put out a very strong statement defending me. They said, we asked him to be there. Well, politicians and the media can play those games. And you're right, your name gets a lot of views. You're probably legit the most- Oh, so that's just a kind of tacit agreement. Wasn't there, hang on. Wasn't there a difference? I don't care about this stuff because it's American politics, but in terms of Arlington, I'm pretty sure there was something particularly controversial about the way Trump did it. Where is it? I know this because- <laughs> My legal sources, my legal team was talking about it. <laughs> is it because of you're doing it for partisan purposes? Donald Trump is reading this comment in synchronization with you, and me calling him a gay communist will just whoosh right over his head. He is a sink for any validation, positive or negative. Thanks for the $10, Grassroots Hedgemon. I really appreciate that. Okay. Hmm. It's something about doing a campaign ad there. But other people have done that as well. It just depends on... I think the difference is, is that you can go there to see the families or whatever else, and you can use the photos after you've been there if you want. But I don't think you can go there for partisan purposes. I think that's where you went a little bit against the rules. Let's get bigger? Okay. Filming or photographing will not be permitted if it conveys the impression that cemetery officials or any visitor or family member is endorsing any product, service, or organization. So if you just go there to commemorate, then you fuck off, but you use the pictures afterwards, that's fine. But if you go there to like endorse your campaign, it's the thumbs up. <laughs> If you go there for the photo op, like that's why you're there and you're doing it while you're there, like that's where it's a bit different. Okay. 
Wow. Specific areas are off limits. What a fucking brain rot conversation, man. Famous person in the world. But on the previous thing, in the spirit of unity, you used to be a Democrat. Yeah. Uh, setting the politicians aside, what do you respect most about people who lean left, who are Democrats themselves or of that persuasion, progressives, liberals, and so on? Well, look, I respect the fact that everybody's in there. And, you know, to a certain extent, life is what you do while you're waiting to die. So you might as well do a good job. I think in terms of what's happening now, I think, you know, we, we have a chance to save the country. This country's going down. And I called it with Venezuela. I called it with a lot of different countries. And this country is going down. If we don't win this election, the election coming up on November 5th is the most important election this country has ever had. Because if we don't win it, I don't know that there'll be another election. And it's going to be a communist country. or close. Mm. And there's a lot of people listening to this, myself included, that doesn't think that Kamala is a communist. Uh, well, she's a Marxist. Her, her father's a Marxist. <laughs> That's right. And she's advocating. Her father is not necessarily a Marxist, okay? Like, there was a whole wiki war about this, about trying to edit the Wikipedia to make him into a Marxist. He is an economist who has written about Marx sometimes, which again, like every other social scientist, and econ economics is partly a social science, uh, will write about Marx at some point in their life. But okay, Lex. At least you guys are plugged into the same sources. God damn it. Fuck. You know, she's advocating for some policies that are towards the direction of um, democratic socialism, let's say. But there's a lot of people that kind of know the way government works and they say, well, none of those policies are going to actually come to reality. It's just being used during the campaign to, you know, uh, groceries are too expensive. We need them cheaper. So let's talk about price controls and that's never going to come to reality. It could come to reality. Look, I mean, she came out with price control. It's been tried like 121 different times at different places over the years. And it's never worked once. It, it leads to communism. It leads to socialism. It leads to having no food on the shelves. <laughs> and it leads to tremendous inflation. It's okay. just a bad idea. Whenever we use terms like communism for her, and I don't know if you know this, but some people call you a fascist. Yeah, they do. So I figure it's a right it's to call that. Clearly, there are states in America that already have price gouging laws. Actually, didn't the United States use price controls during World War II? Uh, fuck me. It's not even, yeah, price gouging laws are not the same as price controls, but yeah, fuck. They're a communist, yeah, they call me a lot worse than I call them. They, they do indeed. Uh, it's just sometimes- It's interesting though, they'll call me something that's terrible and then I'll hit them back. And they'll say, isn't it terrible what Trump said? I said, well, wait a minute, they just called me. So I believe you have to fight fire with fire. I believe they're very evil people. These are evil people. You know, we have an enemy from the outside and we have an enemy from within. And in my opinion, the enemy from within are radical left lunatics. And I think you have to fight back. Whenever there's a lot of fighting fire with fire, it's too easy to forget that there's a middle of America that is uh, that's moderate and kind of sees the good in both sides and just likes one side more than the other in terms of policies. Like I said, there's a lot of people that like your policies, that like your skill in being able to negotiate and end wars, and they don't see the the uh, impending destruction of America. You know, we what war did Trump negotiate to end? What is he talking about? It can't be the Afghan war because apparently that was a failure. Ending that war was a failure, so he can't take credit for that. Hmm. Is it really just him claiming responsibility for ending the war? <laughs> but he just gave all the baggage of actually executing it. <laughs> His fucking pullout plan to Biden. Okay. I have no idea what Lex is talking about there. He's just giving it to him on a fucking plate. Yeah, he's trying to have it in both ways, for sure. We had no wars when I was president. That's a big thing. Not since 78 years has that happened. But we had no wars when I was president. We defeated ISIS, but they were, that was a war that was started that we weren't anywhere near defeating. But think of it, I had no wars. And Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, said the world has to have Trump back because everybody was afraid of Trump. Now, that's what he said. So I'm not using that term, but I think they respected me. But he said China was afraid, Russia was afraid, everybody was afraid. And I, I don't care what word they use. I, probably that's even a better word if you want another truth. Western Sahara. Oh, that could be. Wait, is the Western Sahara War over? Wait, what are you talking about? <laughs> is that is that a troll? Hang on, what happened here? Morocco and the Abraham Records. <laughs> I don't know. In the sense that they uh, they recognize Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara in exchange for Morocco recognizing Israel. Is that what you're talking about? Was that a was there a war though? Was it was it was the Western Sahara War still going on in Trump's presidency? Um, I thought that was like a frozen conflict. If, I don't really know if that's what he's talking about in terms of <laughs> ending wars. 
But okay. But let's use the word respect. They had respect for me. They had respect for the country. I mean, I ended the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, the Russian pipeline. Nobody else could have done that. I ended it. It was done. Then Biden comes in and he gave it. He approved it. So we're defending Germany and these other countries for peanuts compared to what it's worth. And they're paying the person we're defending them against billions and billions of dollars for energy. I said, how does that work? And we had it out with them and it worked out good. And they paid, billions, they paid hundreds of billions of dollars. Or you wouldn't even have a NATO right now. You wouldn't have NATO if it wasn't for oh. But again, it's not really even ending a war. He just kind of gave recognition to Morocco, even though the uh, conflict itself wasn't... It's like, it's like recognizing Jerusalem isn't obviously ending the conflict, or recognizing the Golan Heights isn't ending the conflict. Apparently in 2023, the Western Sahara conflict heated up. <laughs> so he didn't end this. He didn't end any wars here. He just sold it out. Okay. You know, one day I'll learn about what the f*** ha happened here in Western Sahara. Declaration of a return to the armed struggle. Damn, what a familiar sentence. Okay. Well. Me. As the leader of the United States, you were the most powerful man in the world. As you mentioned, not only the most famous, but the most powerful. And if you become leader again, you will have unprecedented power. Just on your own personal psychology, what does that power do to you? Does it, is there any threat of it corrupting how you see the world? No, I don't think so. Look, I've, I've been there for four years. Uh, I could have done a big number on Hillary Clinton. I thought it looked terrible to take the president's wife and put her in prison. She's so lucky. I didn't do anything. She's so lucky. Hillary is a lucky woman because- I, Is there any, I think Trump didn't do anything because they didn't have anything. She didn't plead the fifth once. She sat through all the hearings. There is some, I don't know if it's confirmed. Is it confirmed? I'm pretty sure, did Trump not try to get the DOJ to go after Hillary? Did he not try to get criminal uh, charges against Hillary? Or is that just a rumor? Hmm. I think he probably, yeah, he probably just realized there was nothing and then just left it and just made it look like a nice gesture. So this is in uh, November 2016. Would not pursue a further investigation into her emails to help her heal. <laughs> Would not appoint a special prosecutor to look into the former Secretary of State, as he had pledged during campaigning. Fresh inquiries not off the table, but didn't want to hurt the Clintons. The FBI cleared her. Criticized the private email server. Hmm. So the FBI clears her, and then Trump says, I'm letting you off because I'm a nice guy. Okay. Hmm. Well, well. Didn't he say it was like, because he thinks Biden got the DOJ to go after him. He, he said that was Gestapo-like, didn't he? That's one of his Hitler references. He said that Biden was running a Gestapo administration. <laughs> and this is because of the, what, the Mar-a-Lago raid? Okay. This was the this is the same DOJ that was going after Hunter as well. So uh, okay. Wow. I had a lot of people pushing me too. They wanted to they wanted to see something, but I had I, I could have done something very bad. I thought it looked so bad. Think of it. You have the president of the United States, and you also had Secretary of State, right? She was. But you're gonna put the president's wife in prison? And yet when I got out there, you know, they have all these hoaxes. They're all hoaxes. Oh, but yeah. they have all these Dishonest hoaxes, just like they did felon. in the past with Russia, Russia, Russia. That was a hoax. Uh, the 51 different, uh, you know, agencies or agents. That was a hoax. The whole thing was a hoax. The whole, there were so many hoaxes and scams. And, but I didn't want to put her in jail. And I didn't. And I explained it to people. You know, they say, lock her up, lock her up. It does it, we won. I said, we don't want to put her in jail. We want to bring the country together. I want to bring the country together. You don't bring the country together by putting her in jail. But then when I got out, you know, they went to work on me. It's, it's amazing. And, uh, they suffer from massive Trump derangement syndrome, DDS. <laughs> and I don't know if it's curable from their standpoint. A lot of people are very interested in the footage Sorry, of Sorry, you committed crimes, bro. We know. The, the Pentagon has released a few uh, videos, and uh, there's been anecdotal reports from fighters. Hang on. I don't... I don't know how... This isn't a strong commitment, because I haven't looked that far into it. I think the only reason Trump says this is because he tried to go after Hillary but couldn't. It's just from the New York Times. White House counsel Don McGahn wrote a memo to dissuade Trump, noting that potential consequences could include impeachment. Trump wanted to prosecute former election rival Hillary Clinton and ex-FBI director James Comey, but was talked out of it, the New York Times reported on Tuesday. The president told then White House counsel Don McGahn in the spring that he wanted to order the Justice Department to bring charges against the pair, the Times said, citing two unnamed people familiar with the conversation. 
He wrote a memo to dissuade Trump, noting that the potential consequences for such an action could include impeachment, according to the report. He continued to privately discuss the matter, including the possible appointment of a second special counsel to investigate both Clinton and Comey. Yeah, I think he tried to and failed. I don't know if this is all like 100%, but I think that's the most likely. It's not news that Trump wants DOJ to investigate or prosecute Clinton or Comey, Goldsmith tweeted. Oh yeah, Harvard Law Professor. Long expressed that opinion on Twitter and elsewhere. <laughs> huh. Did they at least transvestigate her? You know what? I don't know. Didn't Lex comment on one of your streams? Could you get him on at some point? Um, I did. So I messaged him once because he was doing a Trump debate thing and wanted guests. He didn't reply though. <sighs> I'm not a big deal, okay? I need to I need to go after a slightly smaller fish, I think, <laughs> than big old Lex. Fighter pilots. So a lot of people want to know, will you help push the Pentagon to release more footage, which a lot of people claim is available? Oh, yeah, sure. I'll do that. I would do that. I'd love to do that. I have to do that. Uh, but they also are pushing me on Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And I did release a lot, but I had people come to me and beg me not to do it. But I'll be mm -hmm. doing that very early on. Uh, yeah, no, but I would do that. There's a moment where you had some hesitation about Epstein, releasing some of the documents on Epstein. Why the hesitation? I don't think I, I mean, mm. I'm not involved. I never went to his island, um, fortunately. But a lot of people did. Why do you think so many smart, powerful people allowed him to get so close? Um, he was a good salesman. He was, you know, was a hale and hearty type of guy. He had some nice assets that he'd throw around, like islands. But a lot of big people went to that island. But fortunately, I was not one of them. It's just very strange for a lot of people that uh, the list though? of clients that went to the island has not been made public. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting, isn't it? Probably will be, by the way. <laughs> so if you're able to, you'll be... Yeah, I'd certainly take a look at it. Now, Kennedy's interesting because it's so many years ago. What did he say again? What did he say about Epstein? How, again, can you imagine if Obama said something? Oh, fuck me, I just, it just in my head. I've known Jeff for 15 years. Terrific guy. He's had a lot of fun to be with. He's a lot of fun to be with. It's even said that he likes beautiful women as much as I do, and many of them are on the younger side. No doubt about it. Jeffrey enjoys his social life. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> no need to speculate. What has he said to that fucking 10 year old? Thursday night. You're going up the escalator? I'm going to be dating her in 10 years. Can you believe it? Hmm. Bro. Thursday night. You're going up the escalator? There is a local urban rumor in Aberdeen, because Trump was here for his golf course, right? There's an urban rumor from one of the uh, council workers who was involved in that whole shit show of trying to get the golf course negotiated. And apparently, one of these guys was talking to Trump, and he's got a 16-year-old daughter next to him, and apparently Trump was like hitting on her. And she, <laughs> I think he just said, your daughter's hot, and she was like 16. Like, it's like an urban myth. Obviously, none of it was recorded, so it's just one person's word. I mean, I've met the guy who said that Trump said that about his daughter, but um, don't know. That's just a story people tell around town. You know, they do that for danger too, because you know, endangers certain people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Kennedy uh, is very different from the Epstein thing. But yeah, I'd be inclined to do the Epstein. I'd have no problem with it. That's great to hear. What gives you strength when you're getting attacked? You're one of the most attacked people in the world. I think you, you, can't, you can't care that much. I know people that care so much about everything, like what people are saying. You can't care too much because you end up choking. One of the tragic things about life is that it ends. How often do you think about your death? Are you afraid of it? I have a friend who's very, very successful, and he's in his 80s, mid-80s, and he asked me that exact same question. I said, I turned it around. I said, well, what about you? He said, I think about it every minute of every day. And then a week later, he called me to tell me something. And he starts off the conversation by going, tick, tock, tick, tock. <laughs> yeah. now, this, is a dark, this is a dark person, you know, in a sense. But uh, it is what it is. I mean, you know, if you're religious, you have, I think, a better feeling toward it. You know, you're supposed to go to heaven, ideally not hell, but you're supposed to go to heaven if you're good. I think our country's missing a lot uh -huh. of religion. I think it really was a much better place with religion. It, it, was some, it was almost a guide, you know, to a certain extent, it was a guide. You want to be good to people. Without religion, there's no real... There are no guardrails. This guy is the I'd least Christian president ever in the fucking White House. Like, what the f***? Okay. Even less than Barack Hussein Obama. I'd love to see us Come get on. back to religion, more religion in this country. Well, Mr. President, thank you for putting yourself out there, and thank you for talking today.
look, I, I love the country. I want to see the country be great. And we have a real mm. chance of doing it, but it's our last chance. And I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this conversation with us. What an incredibly, what an incredibly boring conversation. How disappointing. I mean, I knew I was going to be disappointed, but I didn't know I'd be that disappointed. My God. I don't, it, the thing is, like, if you're an interviewer, you could say, and I feel okay about saying this about people I've interviewed, if someone's a bit wacky, it's okay to just let them speak because you want the audience to just be like, okay, this is who this person is. Here we go. Might not debate. It's an interview. Um, but that was just, everyone knows all those lines from Trump. That's, that's just Trump's, that's a Trump speech. That's a Trump rally speech that he just gave quietly to Lex in the form of an interview. I don't know why you would do that. Like everyone knows what Trump's talking points are. Everyone knows his little list, <laughs> his little one dimensional fucking like post-it note of talking points that he just manages to make last two hours. But like, why wouldn't you use the opportunity to give like pushback to get a more, like a more unique conversation? I don't get it. Like you might as well have just taken you might as well have just got Trump to read out one of his speeches <laughs> at his rallies and just edit Lex in afterwards. He's deleting comments on YouTube and Reddit. Is he? I mean, be careful with that because YouTube, uh, and I don't know if Reddit does, but YouTube will auto delete comments a lot, especially if you're spamming. Or it's just all DGG. Uh, you do one of those ones. Okay. I don't know. Don't like it. Don't like it. Not impressed.